Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries and John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light, the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And this Bible study is going to be basically the light versus the darkness. Now, there are two aspects to this. What is darkness? Well, darkness is just merely the absence of light. Just as cold is the absence of warmth or heat. And I guess you could say evil is just the absence of good. And if you take the word good, G-O-O-D, and remove an O, and there you got God, right? So let's go to the beginning, Genesis. You know, I always find it interesting. When you look at the word Genesis, what is the first four letters. G-E-N-E. -E, gene, as in genetics or generator. You know, gene, DNA. God has a race of people on this earth that he created uh, you know, a generator. What does a generator do? It produces power. You know, it's funny how much of the Bible and English are tied in together. Now, there is two aspects of light and darkness. There's a physical aspect, and then there's a spiritual aspect and of course we're going to get more into that soon so Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and I'll tell you what when I first came back to the Lord and I got my King James Bible first thing I did was turn to Genesis 1 1 the beginning and I started reading. And a lot of the idiots will just, they think Matthew is the start of the Bible. No, no, no. So, Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, well, it wasn't the beginning of God, it was the beginning of what he created time because we are creatures of time basically in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness darkness an absence of light and darkness was upon the face of the earth, uh, face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day so 
Do you know that the uh, when the sun goes down in the evening, in God's calendar, that's the beginning of a new day. Not midnight. So you go from darkness to light. When the morning comes, you know, uh, when it gets dark, that's the beginning of a new day. The dusk. So you go from darkness to light. And that's in the physical realm. Well, guess what? It works the same way in the spiritual realm. When we are born, we're born in darkness. And for some of us, the Spirit of God moves upon us. Just like the Lord's Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. And what is the human body? I've read it's 93% water. So if the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Can I get an amen? So it works. Seems like there's a physical aspect, and then there's a spiritual aspect. If God, the Spirit of God doesn't move upon us, you'll never never come to the realization of needing a savior and coming to the feet of the king in john chapter 6 in verse 44 jesus said no man and that includes women you know how do you spell women W-O-M-A-N, or a woman, W-O-M-A-N. So when the Lord's talking about mankind, he's not just talking about the males. Since the woman was taken from the side of the man. No man can come to me except the Father, which hath sent me, draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 65. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Do you realize that even before the Lord created the earth, that he made provisions to redeem mankind from sin back to him. What? What are you talking about, Chaplain Bob? Well, Revelation 13 and verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him who worship the dragon. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Did you know the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world? And who is this Lamb? I hope you know the answer, but I'm going to tell you anyways. Well, two places it's always said in the bible that in the, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established john the baptist in the book of john chapter 1 verse 36 and looking upon jesus as he walked he saith behold the lamb of god Okay, that's one witness. Is there a second witness? 
Well, you got John the Baptist, and then you got John, the beloved apostle. They're not the same. It's a different John. Do you know that John, St. John, the, you know, John the Baptist got beheaded. Uh, Herod's, Herod married his brother's wife. And uh, John complained about that, John the Baptist. And uh, she uh, had a little problem with that. And she had uh, her husband cut off John's head. But then there was St. John. They call him St. John. John the Apostle. He wrote the book of Revelation. Do you know out of all the apostles... He was the only one that wasn't killed for the faith, according per the you know history, the Bible, legends, whatever. He's the only one. According to legend, they tried to kill him. And they couldn't do it. So they banished him to the Isle of Patmos. Said, so, well, we can't kill this guy, so let's get rid of him. And they just, you know, took him to the Isle of Patmos and dropped him off. And there he penned the book of Revelation. Revelation 17 and verse 14. John writes, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Wow. Those that are in Christ are the chosen people. Unless, of course, you want to believe the Antichrists are plural. Antichrists, plural. Antichrists, plural, are God's chosen. Well, most of your so-called churches believe that the antichrists are god's chosen but hey i believe the bible where i think the christians are god's chosen people i mean didn't even jesus say that uh well let's take a look in john chapter 10 27 jesus said my sheep hear my voice and i know them and they follow me. Now, there is a fourth dimension, which is, my guess, is a spiritual dimension. So, we are basically spiritual beings trapped in a physical terrestrial body. I'm going to get to terrestrial and celestial, uh, trapped in time. So we're going to take a look at that. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3 real quick. Verse 16. That he, Jesus, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit, his spirit, in the inner man. See, there's a spiritual inner man, and then there's a physical outer man, which is the flesh. Verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love. And when the Lord was asked about the uh, what was the great commandment in the law, he said, uh, to love the Lord and to love thy neighbor. He said, on these two things, uh, Hang all the law on the prophets. 
So let's read, well, let's read that real quick. I know in previous studies, I've, uh, I've beat that horse to death, almost. But let's take a look. All right, Matthew 22, starting in verse 36. They said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord, love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And hopefully you don't have Satanists as neighbors, right? But if you listen to the Seventh-day Adventists or the Hebrew Roots people, oh, oh, no, 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 that's, no, you got to keep the Sabbath. And then 600 and something other all laws, of, you know. It's funny, Jesus broke it down to two laws. So, back to Ephesians 3, 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth that's one length and length two and depth that's three and height did you catch that breadth length depth and height four dimensions one of them has got to be we are three-dimensional beings. There's got to be a fourth one, and it has to be spiritual. It has to be, as far as I can tell. And perhaps one day I'll do a study on these four words in the Greek. But sadly, all the publishing companies now are in the hands of the devil's kids, so I'm sure all the word meanings are gone and changed, you know. In the 1920s, if you'd have said, oh, she's gay or he's gay, you know, you'd been talking about, oh, they're happy. They're fun to be with, you know. And uh, what does it mean today? Well, not the same thing. That's for sure. So, breadth, length, depth, height. One, two, three, four. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. And that's Ephesians 3.19. So, we started in 16 and ended up in 19. All right. Uh... We are going to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, I've had, you know, I'm sure you've heard me talk about it, but a lot of people nowadays are trying to discredit the writings of Paul. And Paul was a scholar. I wish I knew 25% of what Paul knew. Really, I do. And people can't understand Paul. So they're, you know, if they can't understand something, they just say, oh, well, oh, he's, he's not real. He was fake. Well, you know, the book of 2 Peter calls Paul a brother. And then in the book of Acts, Paul was there with the apostles and not one time do we read in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit told the apostles, watch out for this guy, he's he's bad news. No, you didn't you don't you don't read that. Uh-uh. Nope. Doesn't happen. And according to scholars that I would trust, uh, Apostle Luke wrote the book of Acts. So 
But Paul was a scholar. Paul wasn't a fisherman. Paul was a scholar. Paul knew Greek. Paul knew Hebrew. And being a Roman citizen, he probably knew Latin too. So, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 38. But God giveth it a body, a body, as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Now, what is a terrestrial body? Well, have you ever heard of an aquarium? You know, a, a box-like structure made of glass where they keep fish, right? A aquarium. It comes from aqua, which is a uh, Latin word for water. Guys, have you ever heard of Aquaman? I think, uh, yeah, that's uh, DC Comics. Aquaman, right? Water. Aqua. Ladies, you've heard of the color aqua, I'm sure. You know, blue, a type of blue. That has reference to water. Aqua aquarium. Aquarium. And then you got people have terrariums, which is where they take basically uh, the same type of box thing with uh, glass. And then they put, I don't know, maybe a snakes or snake or lizards or whatever they have at it. It's called a terrarium. Usually they have rocks and plants and whatever, usually reptiles of some sort that they put into a terrarium. Terra, T-E-R-R-A, has reference to Earth. Have you ever heard of a, um, where they're talking about an area and they talk about the terrain? That's where it comes from. Terrain, is it mountainous? Is it a swamp? Is it a forest? Uh, you know, how is the terrain? Is it rivers? What? You know, desert? So, that's, Terra has reference to Earth. All right, so there's bodies terrestrial. What about celestial bodies? Ah. So, we in the flesh are terrestrial bodies. When God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, terrestrial, the, the earth, dirt, right? God took the dirt, formed man, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. Bodies terrestrial. So, celestial means it's relating to the sky or the heavens. For example, in astronomy. Or, it could be of a spiritual application. Would not an angel be a celestial type being? I believe so. Absolutely. 
So in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 40, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. Hmm. And then you have references where the angels are referred to as stars. And this can be proven in a couple of places. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20. The mystery. A lot of mysteries in the Bible. You got to dig for the mysteries. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, Whoa, whoa, what, do can, what do candlesticks do? They give light. All right? The seven stars are the angels. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Did you know that churches have angels? Wow, can we get a spiritual application for that? I wonder what kind of angel the uh, Vatican has. <laughs> if you have to, uh, if you have to wonder about that for more than a couple of seconds, eh, well, whatever. Let's read Jude, the book of Jude, chapter 1. Well, there's only one chapter in Jude. But uh, we're going to start in verse 6. And the angels... So what is the subject? Angels. And the angels which kept not their first estate. What was their first estate? Heaven. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. What was their habitation? It was heaven. But left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness. Darkness. Unto the judgment of the great day. So these angels are, uh, they didn't keep their original place. And they're reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. Verse 7. Listen to this. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah. Wow. He's comparing these angels with Sodom and Gomorrah. And the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. Wow. What do you think happened in Genesis 6? I mean, you know, why did God destroy the earth in the flood? Oh, they were wicked, Chaplain Bob. Yeah, and then they'll tell you that the sons of God and the daughters of men means that godly men married these ungodly women, and then they had giants for children, and then God says, well, I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to drown them. What? Seriously, they teach this. Yeah, all the men were godly and all the women were ungodly. And then they had giants for children. Uh, I don't think so. The subject of this chapter was the angels which kept not their first estate, left their habitation, reserved everlasting chains under darkness unto judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, 
giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. Did you see the uh, subject change? I didn't. We're still talking about the angels. And going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion. What is dominion? Uh, it's where you get the word dominate. God has dominion of the heaven and the earth. It's his domain. It belongs to him. He created it. He rules it. It's his. But these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. They despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. Verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, we're talking about angels still, aren't we? Has anything changed? No. When contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. See, even Michael, the angel, when contending with the devil, wouldn't say, you know, all he would do is say, the Lord rebuke thee. Verse 10, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. What was uh, the way of Cain? Murder. Murder. And ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. Uh, what did Balaam do? Balaam was a prophet. And for money, for pieces of whatever, gold or silver or whatever, he taught an enemy of Israel how to get Israel to sin so the Lord would withdraw his protection and allow him to be judged or punished. Oh yeah, big time. He taught him, what did, what did Balaam do? He said, hey, have some of those women uh, dress up real scantily, you know, Show a lot of cleavage and a little bit of bun on the backside there and a lot of leg. Oh, yeah. And then dance in front of the uh, guys. And then uh, get them in the tent and seduce them. And God will uh, God will show you. God will show, show, uh, show you what he'll do to his people. That's exactly what happened. Think things are any different today? No. Well, and if you really are interested, you can read Numbers chapter 22, Numbers chapter 23, and Numbers chapter 31. Let's read Numbers 31, 16. Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So Balaam uh, had Balak, the enemy of Israel, uh, to play around with the women and to worship the false god Baal, or Baal. And, uh, you know, that's, that's how that worked. Not good. So, Jude 1. Woe unto them, verse 11, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. Who is Cory? Uh, Moses was leading Israel out of, uh, into the wilderness and Korah, Cory, 
was the, um, he was a Levite. And he challenged Moses' authority. And basically, you know, when the Lord gives Moses the authority to tell him what to do and where to go and, you know, how to do things, uh, he challenged Moses' authority. So basically, he's challenging the Lord and is saying, hey, I'm just as qualified to lead these people as you are. But the thing is, the Lord didn't call him. So the earth opened up like an earthquake. They fell down into this pit and the earth closed up on them. And that's how they died. So the Lord uh, showed them a couple things. Oh, you want to you want to challenge the guy that I picked to lead this people? I don't think so. So they perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Verse 12. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you feeding themselves without fear clouds they are without water carried about of winds trees whose fruit withereth without fruit twice dead twice dead plucked up by the roots how can you be twice dead well do you know that everybody's going to have uh at least one well not everybody there is going to be a group of people when the lord returns that never see death but that's future but most the great majority of people have at least one death physical death your your physical terrestrial body dies if you're in christ well, then you're not going to see the second death. But if you're without Christ, you're going to see the second death. So maybe I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, yeah. So twice dead plucked up by the roots raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame wandering stars wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever oh yeah and Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these saying behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers. Oh, God hates complainers. Uh, when Israel was wandering in the desert, guess what they did? They complained, 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 complained. Oh, I'm so sick and tired of this manna. Manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner. Manna, 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 manna. I'm tired of it. Be careful what you wish for. These are murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lusts with their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. You know, rich people have advantage. They get to go to the best colleges, universities, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Verse 17, but beloved, Remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus, how that they told you that there should be mockers, mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. 
Verse 19. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. See, when you're in the Lord and you tell them, hey, uh, you know, you shouldn't be doing those things. They're going to separate from you. I've seen it. <laughs> but ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Thank, thank the Lord there were some people that uh, cared enough to, to witness to me in a doctor's office when I was so sick I was dying. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And that's our garment. We're wearing the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Now, in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapters 1 through 5, people were living for hundreds of years. It was a totally different world before and after the flood. In Genesis 6, 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, Yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. So the Lord decided to put a time limit on our lives. All right, remember in Jude, we were talking about uh, uh, twice dead, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, twice dead, died in the... The flesh died in the spirit. Well, was there a witness to this? Revelation chapter 2 and verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. See, there's a first death of the flesh, and then there's going to be a second death of, I guess, the soul spirit, I, you know. Revelation 20, verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Oh, yeah. And the end time kingdom of darkness... Well, let's read Isaiah chapter 21. Isaiah is a wonderful book. Absolutely wonderful. I did a commentary on it. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how great it was, but I did the best I could um, with what I had. You know, there's many people that know far more than I do, but, you know, But let's take a look. Isaiah 21, verse 9. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Why would you say is fallen, is fallen? Physically, spiritually, right? And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. Is there a New Testament witness? Revelation 14, 8. And there followed another angel saying, 
Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Spiritual fornication. Revelation 18, 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. How do you spell devil? Well, you take the word evil and you put a D in front of it. Devil. And has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And I did a Bible study on who Babylon is. There was a physical Babylon that was destroyed. And then in the end times, there is a spiritual Babylon that will be destroyed. So there's, for the, those that are not in Christ, there's going to be two deaths. But to those that are in Christ, there's only one. Ver, let's see, Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. The second death will have no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Wow. And a thousand years, that's, that's just the introduction, people. That's the introduction. So I guess this is going to be part one. I'm just laying the foundation. But first we're going to do the kingdom of darkness and the children of darkness. And then we're going to do the kingdom and children of light. Because darkness and light, there's a lot of references to that in the uh, Bible. A lot. And there is a, uh, not only a physical representation, but there is a spiritual representation. Oh, something I almost forgot. There is, I mentioned the fourth dimension, which is the spiritual dimension. Well, let's take a reading of in the book of Kings, the second chapter, I'm sorry, second Kings, second chapter. So second chapter of second Kings, there's a first Kings and then a second Kings. And then we're going to look at chapter two, verse one. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? Yeah, don't you, don't you know that uh, the Lord's going to take your uh, master away? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. Basically, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Keep quiet. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha 
and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Verse 6, And Elisha said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. I'm not going to leave you. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view far off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. Basically, like what happened uh, when Israel crossed the Red Sea, Moses, you know, uh, by the power of God, parted the Red Sea, right? Verse 9, And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee, before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. So here it is, Elijah asks Elisha, oh, hey, uh, what, what do you want from me before I'm gone? Oh, I want double what you got. I know you got Holy Spirit power. I want double. Verse 10, and he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Oh, boy, that's a tall order, buddy boy. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. So if you see me when I'm taken away, your wish is granted. But if you don't, the Lord said no. Verse 11. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, a chariot of fire and horses of fire, boy, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Can you imagine that? What was that stupid uh, movie with, uh, oh, I can't think of his name. Yeah, Nicolas Cage, when he was riding around on that motorcycle as a flaming skeleton. You know, that's how, that's how Hollywood mocks us, you know? So there is a chariot of fire and horses of fire. They took Elijah up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it. Now remember... Elijah said that if Elisha saw it, his wish for double portion would be granted. And he's seeing this. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. I don't know why he tore him in two. Uh, maybe it has something to do with the double portion. I don't know. Anybody understands this better than me? Please leave a comment. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of, his, of Elijah? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. So he parted the waters just like Elijah did, just like Moses did. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, 
the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. You see, people, unless the Lord opens your spiritual eyes, you cannot see the spiritual realm. It's there, but we can't see it in our terrestrial bodies. Unless the Lord opens your spiritual eyes, probably a good thing. Can you imagine all those foul, evil devil spirits surrounding us, wanting to kill us? I mean, I could... Unbelievable. So, all right, well, I guess this would be almost an hour. This would be a good time to finish up part one. And we will continue darkness and light. And right now, generally, our spiritual eyes are in darkness. But that will change one day. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the God the Father and, and the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.